Hey everyone, welcome to the Elisa Childers podcast where we equip Christians to identify the core beliefs of historic Christianity, discern its counterfeits, and proclaim the gospel with clarity, kindness, and truth. And today we're going to be talking about all things youth ministry with a special guest who recently wrote a booklet called The Failure of Youth Ministry and How to Fix It. I know that's a provocative title indeed, so we are going to be chatting about the book booklet a bit. And then we're going to be opening it up for questions that we will take live. Our hope and prayer for this broadcast today is to encourage youth leaders not to bash youth ministry and youth leaders, but rather to equip you, to encourage you, and maybe provide a really clarifying path forward uh, to maybe not repeat some mistakes that have been made in church past, but to give us a good, strong way forward. So if you're listening on audio platforms like iTunes, Google, and Spotify, I'd like to invite you over to YouTube because most of the interviews that you hear are also available on the video format. So plus when we do these live streams, if you're subscribed on YouTube, uh, then you can know when we're going to be doing these and you can join live and you can be able to ask your questions as well. And so be sure that when you subscribe, you click that bell icon because that will give you a way to enable notifications. And this will alert you every time we release a new video and we have got some really great conversations coming up. You're not gonna wanna miss. Next week, we're gonna be talking with Dr. H.C. Felder who wrote the book, The African American Guide to the Bible. This is one of the interviews that we pre-recorded from the Southern Evangelical Seminary's National National Apologetics Conference. And so with Dr. Felder, we discuss questions like, is Christianity the white man's religion? Does the Bible support and condone slavery or and, and racism? So it was a very fascinating conversation. You're not going to want to miss. So be sure you're subscribed and that you have those notifications enabled. I uh, want to talk to you a bit about some things we have coming up this summer. This summer, is crazy busy. We have got a lot going on. If you are in, I'm going to say this wrong, Puyallup, Washington, if you're in that area, I'm going to be at the Lighthouse Christian Center for their women's conference there on June 17th through the 18th. You can go to lighthousehome.org slash women for more information there. I'm also going to be in California a couple times here coming up. Uh, August 12th and 13th, I'll be at the Wildwood Calvary Chapel in Yucaipa, California for their women's conference. If you are in that area and you'd like more information, you can go to Wild wildwoodcalvarychapel.com. And then August 20th, I'll be back in California in San Jose at Hillside Church for their women's conference. More information there, you can go to hillside.org. All right. So I am very excited about this conversation today. I want to let you know right off the bat, we will be taking your questions live. You can put those questions in at any time. What we'll do is when we come to our question portion of the interview, I will just go to the beginning and we'll start from the beginning of the questions and go through. So if you think you've got a question, put it in now because uh, I'm not sure we'll even be able to get through all of them, but we will certainly try. So I want to uh, introduce you to my guest. He's been on the podcast podcast before to talk about his book, Unlikely Fighter. Uh, Greg Steer is an evangelist, an author, a speaker, and the founder of Dare to Share Ministries. Now, I mentioned that he's written a booklet about the failure of youth ministry. He let me know that you can actually download this booklet for free. So you can go, and I'll put this in the comment section as well on YouTube, but you can go to daretoshare.org slash resources slash failure dash of dash youth dash ministry. Okay, so you can download that for free. We'll also put a link to that in the podcast notes. But Greg, so glad to have you on the show today. Thanks for coming back on. Thanks, Elisa. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. Me too. And I'd love for you to give us a little bit of context. First, tell us about your ministry. You, you told us a little bit about it last time, but for anybody who's new to you and what you do, tell us a little bit about that. And then maybe what led you to write a, a booklet that's really got quite a provocative title, The Failure of Youth Ministry and what we can do about it or how we can fix it. What is it? I, I had it up there. And how to fix it. Yeah. How to fix and it, it. Right. Yeah, so you know, my family was actually radically transformed by a youth ministry that was on fire for Christ. So right up front, I just gotta say, I love youth ministry done right. Um, 
and I believe in it. My my inner city family, a hillbilly preacher who believed in the power of the gospel and the potential of young people, reached every single one of my family members with the gospel. I got involved in his youth ministry early on. And uh, when I left, I uh, planted a church. Uh, we you had a strong youth ministry there. Uh, in 1999, I was running Dare to Share and the church at the same time pastoring and leading Dare to Share. And then the Columbine High School shooting took place. And my heart broke because I thought, where were all the Christian kids to reach out uh, to the shooters and just felt compelled uh, to go full time and to Dare to Share. So resigned from the church and for 30 years, I've been um, leading Dare to Share. We started in 1991, and um, I, I believe in the power of the gospel, and the potential of young people. But at the same time, uh, just taking a sober look at youth ministry, Lisa, it's failed. Mm. Uh, we're stuck in the 80s mm. with our model. Uh, you know, if if you read the Pine Tops Foundation report, the Great Opportunity, we're losing a million evangelical teenagers per year. They're not just leaving the church, they're leaving their faith. Mm. So uh, we need to educate them, ground them in sound theology. I know you didn't ask me to do this, but that's that's the reason I love your book, Another Gospel. Oh. <laughs> Seriously, uh, I encourage youth leaders to read that book because mm. I really believe progressive Christianity has been a uh, cancer uh, on, on the body of Christ and really caused a lot of students to doubt their faith. Um, but it's, that's not the only reason teens are leaving their faith. I think we have, we've tried to entertain them, uh, and we're just losing them. I mean, they have more fun on their phones than they do a youth group meeting anymore. Yeah. Uh, and they find community there as well. So we're, we're stuck in the eighties with, you know, uh, pizza and dodgeball and a short Bible lesson. It's not mm. enough. Um, yeah. At the well, same time, believe in youth ministry. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and, and same here. In fact, I was talking with a teenager this morning and this is a, a teen that is very serious about Christianity. She loves Jesus. She's very serious about the Bible and becoming biblically literate and studying and just very committed uh, young person. And she said that it's been very difficult for her as she's gone around and tried different youth groups uh, in, in the area. And it see, she said, every place I go, I'm the only person who shows up with a Bible. The lesson is really short and it's not very deep and, and it's not even really teaching typically. It's just sort of like everybody kind of just sits around and talks about a couple things. And so she was expressing frustration as a, as someone who's serious about her faith, that it's very difficult to find a place where she can be discipled by youth leaders. And so, um, you, you talk about this in the opening of your booklet about two brutal realities realities, one of which you just expressed. Christian young people are leaving the church in record numbers. Um, I think there are lots of reasons for that. Um, but number two, you said few of the current youth ministry models are effectively reaching and retaining Gen Z. And so I thought maybe we could talk, obviously, when we talk about youth ministry, we're talking about the first generation who are, as you mentioned with the phones, digital natives. Like, like you and me, Greg, we had to learn how to communicate online. Gen Z is having to learn how to communicate offline because the, their native language is that that phone and that, that digital language. So um, how I'd love for you to kind of set this up because we're going to talk through some keys you give us in your booklet. But tell us a little bit about Gen Z and why. I mean, I think this is just we need to do something different because this generation is just it's like uh, almost like a different culture, isn't it? It is. And it's, you know, Barna calls it the first post-Christian generation in the history of the United States. And so it is. It's an unreached people group. So how are we going to reach them? How are we going to mobilize them? And the good news is, and I'm a good news guy. As a matter of fact, it was hard for me to come up with that title, The Failure of Youth Ministry, because I absolutely love youth ministry. I love youth leaders and I love teenagers. But we have to face that brutal reality. You know, um, it was uh, General uh, James Stockdale that was uh, imprisoned in the Vietnam War. And Jim Collins interviewed him for his book, Good to Great. What kept you alive for eight years when you were tortured over 20 times? He's like, you know what? Uh, we faced the brutal reality, but we did not lose hope. We weren't optimists. The optimists died. We weren't pessimists. The pessimists died. The ones who faced the brutal reality but refused to lose hope are the ones that survived. So I think we need to face the brutal reality that we're losing this generation. We're failing to reach the generation out there, and we're failing to keep the generation in here. But we don't lose hope. 
because the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of human warfare. It's it's spiritual weapons that have the power to tear down strongholds. God's kingdom can move forward. And so really our our uh, encouragement is that we have everything we need. Second Peter 1, 3 says we have everything we need for life and godliness. And I would like to insert, not adding to the text, of course, um, because I don't want to be the subject of a new book. No, um, <laughs> uh, but I think we have everything we need for youth ministry. God's given mm -hmm. us everything that we need. And it is literally uh, costs no budget, uh, but it will cost you everything you have at the same time. So I think we just need to shift the way that we're doing youth ministry. The good news, Elisa, about Gen Z, they're looking for a cause. Mm. They're looking for a mission. I mean you if you look at uh, uh teenagers you know it stopping human trafficking or uh eliminating uh poverty uh they're looking for something uh to to take care of the earth you know uh creation care environmentalism something and so i think we need to recalibrate this whole christianity as as a great big cause mm -hmm. that jesus has given us to go and make disciples of all nations that's great. We're going to talk through five keys uh, that you present as ways we can maybe fix what's gone wrong. I remember, uh, Greg, I worked at Starbucks back in, no, gosh, it was before I moved to Nashville. So this would have been somewhere around 98, 99. And I remember working, I was in Los Angeles and I was working, one of my coworkers was this guy who had no Christian background at all. And yet he was going to the the local youth group on the weekends because they were doing skate parties and things like that. And I remember thinking, that's such a great way to reach out to somebody who might not otherwise walk into a church. And so I, I get why we did so much of the games and the part, the pizza parties. And I know that's almost become a cliche. People joke about oh, the pizza parties and, and dodgeball or whatever. And, you know, hey, yeah, you feed kids. They might, they're going to show up. There's nothing wrong with that. But I wonder if when we're talking about recalibrating now, it's like kids aren't looking necessarily to find a place to go skate. Because like you mentioned, they have everything on their phones and their entire worlds now have come to revolve around uh, their phones and their, their digital media outlets. And so you, you give us here five ways. And this is, again, we want to be encouraging to youth leaders out there today. We're, this isn't just a, a bashing session. We really want to help and equip. And so um, let's talk through some of these keys. And then again, we're going to open this up for questions. So if you've just joined us and you, you have a question about youth ministry, how we can fix it, put the word question before your question so that when we search through all the questions will come up and we'll try to take them in order when it comes to that portion of the interview. But Greg, let's talk about uh, number one here. You put that it's do whatever it takes. What do you mean by that? Do whatever it takes. Well, you know, I think we get it stuck in a system and pretty soon we, you know, that we become institutionalized. Mm. You see it with the church of Ephesus in Acts 19 Paul takes the believers with them into the school of Tyrannus. He trains them every day for two years. It says, so that every Jew and Greek in the province of Asia hears the word of the Lord. Well, they, they, all the unbelievers weren't going to the school of Tyrannus. That's modern Turkey, province of Asia. They were trained, equipped, and they saturated the whole re region of uh, Turkey with the gospel, you know, the province of Asia. Forty years later, if you have a later view of Revelation, he writes in Revelation 2, you know, Jesus, through the pen of John, writes, hey, your systems are great, your theology is great, you know, you rebuke false teachers, that's great, but I have this against you, you left your first love. You become institutionalized. Uh, do what you did at first. What did they do at first? They were so in love with Jesus, they went out and told everybody about him. So I, I think we need to do whatever it takes to change the system. So we had to do that at Dare to Share five years ago. Our vision is every teen everywhere hearing the gospel from a friend. We are doing these major conferences all over the United States, big conferences and big arenas and large churches. We realized we cannot get there this way. So we had to we had to kill the sacred cow mm. and whatever it took. We killed those and we shifted to a simulcast and a bunch of other different things. But the reach has gone exponential because we were willing to do whatever it took. And so my question to a youth leader, are you willing to change the system? Are you willing to adjust? And again, I think it, with youth ministry, we're not saying stop doing games, stop having fun. It's okay to have some sizzle as long as you got some steak. 
right? <laughs> and uh, you know, when you go to when you go to Chili's, you hear the sizzle of the fajitas going by. You're like, hmm, I'll have that because there's steak attached to it, right? It's okay to have some fun and games, but we need to get down to business with students, and be, we need to be willing to do whatever it takes. And good news is we're seeing more and more youth leaders kind of adopt this approach and this mentality, and they're seeing significant spiritual growth in their students and also numeric growth with new believers being added to the group. So it's pretty exciting. So I think about probably the tension that a lot of youth leaders might find themselves in where they're thinking, well, if I go too deep into theology or apologetics, I'm going to lose kids. So maybe I'll yeah. just keep it lighter. I, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll just give them a little taste. And I certainly understand the impetus there. But then I saw a meme this week and it really was powerful. It was saying the kids that you think can handle you know, a, a theology lesson are the same ones learning physics and calculus in school. You know, they're, it's, they're not yeah. stupid. And no. I, I get that there's a tension there, but I wonder if you could speak to that as well, because I mean, I have some thoughts on it, but I, as an experienced youth leader yourself, what advice might you give to youth leaders who might be thinking, well, you know, I, I'm not sure I want to go too deep because I, they may not come back. You know, and I think it's how we go deep. If we if we do a 45 minute lecture with students, uh, we may lose them, right? Uh, if we just start that way. I think we start, we, we do a thing at Dare to Share called alternative teaching. Ask, listen, teach. So ask a question. Hey, tell us what you think about the whole LGBTQ plus. Sin, not a sin, you know, and just ask the question and let students answer and wait through the awkward. We, we have a saying at Dare to Share, awkward is awesome. So <laughs> just wait through the awkward because one student will share, then another, then another. And I guarantee you, you're going to kick over the bucket with a question like that. And mm -hmm. it's going to be, but then you pick up the mop of God's word and you start dealing with that. You know, talk about a theological issue, you know, who is God and ask the question, listen, and then teach. And if you don't, one of the reasons youth leaders don't do it this way is because they're afraid students are going to ask them a question. They don't mm. have the answer. But one of the best things you can do as a youth leader and say, that is a great question. I've not through that thought through that. I'm going to think through it this week. I'm going to study. I'm going to come back next week with an answer and let's have that. Let's continue the conversation. Thank yes. you for stuff. Yes. And you learn it. You see, oh my goodness, they don't, you know, they're learning too. You know, yes. the one rule, the one rule is that this book is is the authority the word of god right and this is this is where we take our cues from and so you know i think actually students are hungry i i was speaking on one time on hell i do a dramatic presentation about it's called letters from hell what if you had a letter that from hell from a friend that you that died without christ and you never told them what would they say but then i attached some theology around the reality of hell according to scripture and this girl came up to me i'll never forget it after a dare to share event, she goes, why has my youth leader never talked to me about hell? I did not realize mm. my friends are going to die and go to hell if they don't put their faith in Christ. Nobody ever told me that. Why? I go, I don't, I don't know. You don't have to ask your youth leader that. I really find, Elisa, that teenagers are hungry for theology, but you mm. got to make it. Sorry, could you say that again? Oh, that was. Uh... <laughs> Siri thought you were talking to her. <laughs> Siri's hungry for theology. I, just I turned... know. Yeah, she wants to know. Um, but I think they're hungry for it. I think we got to communicate it in a way, though, that is relevant for students. And I think what you're describing is really just creating a felt need. And I learned this lesson the hard way when I started teaching apologetics to young people and to students. I think the first time I did it, I just opened up my notes and started talking and it was like snooze, right? But then I watched uh, like our friend Sean McDowell and, and Brett Kunkel do atheist role plays with young people where they, they come in and they kind of play the atheist and then they let the Christian kids try to defend what they believe. And then they dismantle basically what they believe, which gets the kids to go, okay, now I need to know how to, how to answer this. Cause I thought I knew what I was talking about. And when I did that, I discovered that they brought their friends the next week and it just created a great felt need. And I have found that kids will really sit and listen and be eager to learn if they can understand why it's relevant to them, why it's something that matters to them. Totally. And so years ago, we did a reality series that Dare to Share. We took a Mormon, a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Jew. Sounds like a setup to a joke. It does. A 
and we met a priest. No, we went to Maui for eight days and had a beach house and we filmed a reality series and had discussions. Questions like, who is God? Is there a God? You know, why are we here? Um, you know, was Jesus who he claimed to be? Um, what do you think about the Bible? We had all these questions, you know, what happens after you die? And what we found is uh, it became nine 30 minute episodes that youth groups would show they would invite their friends to have these deep discussions around these videos that spark that question. And then the youth leader would share from God's word how, how it applied. So it is so important. I, I do think not to one up Sean McDowell and Brent, because those guys are way smarter than me, mm -hmm. but I would say this, there's, there's an even better way to do that. And for 30 years at Dare to Share, we train students and we take all of them out mm. thousands at the same time to share the gospel. And we have them connect with their friends online, but also talk to strangers. They come back full of excitement and full of questions and hungry to learn more uh, because they, they want to know what they believe and why they believe. And what a role play can't do is put you in that absolute moment of full dependence on the Holy Spirit to help you in that moment of questioning when you're talking to an atheist or Jehovah's Witness or Wiccan or Scientologist or whatever. Yeah, and this actually leads us right into the second key to help sort of fix what's broken in youth ministry. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. But if you're just joining us, we're talking about the failure of youth, youth ministry and how to fix it. If you have a question, we're going to be going to your questions live. Put the word question before your question so that all the questions will come up in a row and we won't have to wade through all of the chat. But please take this opportunity to ask your questions about if you're a youth leader or if you have a, a student in your life and you have a question or, or something you'd like to know, please put your questions in there now and we'll start going through them in just a moment. But the second key, Greg, in your booklet about how to fix what's wrong with youth ministry is pray like never before. I don't, I mean, it seems like such an obvious thing, but sometimes I think we maybe underestimate the value of prayer and, and depending on the Holy Spirit, as you mentioned. Yeah. And I, and I think for youth that this, you know, obviously with teenagers sharing the gospel, anybody sharing the gospel, prayer is going to be a huge key to that. And, uh, but I think really praying for our students and really praying for revival and transformation. You know, when Paul writes to Timothy about how to really program the church at Ephesus in 1 Timothy 2, he says, first of all, he doesn't say, first of all, exegete the word. First of all, uh, you know, figure out your music. He says, first of all, prayers, thanksgivings, intercessions be made for everyone because God and kings and authorities and everyone, God wants everyone to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. He's basically saying the very first priority in your church services has got to be intercessory prayer for the lost. Mm. Now you think about that. We spend more time in announcements than intercessory prayer for the lost and wonder why we don't experience revival. I have a friend who's a Navy SEAL. Uh, he's, he's, uh, name is Todd Peters. He's one of the campus pastors at McLean Bible. He became the youth pastor after retiring as a Navy SEAL. He goes, how do I do, uh, how do I build an effective youth ministry? So I had written a book called Gospelize Your Youth Ministry. The seven values, the first value was intercessory prayer fuels it. He began to implement that with 500 teens. They get that when they started youth group after the games, okay, we're going to start, hit your knees. They literally hit their knees and prayed for their lost friends to start every youth group meeting. Uh, I mean, you talk about implementing that as a primary strategy and God caused that youth ministry to grow and to thrive because when we pray, we're calling down, you know, not budget from our treasurer, but we're, the budget of the Trinity is available to us. The entire power of the Trinity is available to us, ready for us to access through prayer, especially when it comes to advancing the kingdom of God forward. So. Man, I think you got to look at youth leaders listening to this, moms, dads, grandparents, whoever. We have to look at prayer as a primary duty of every Christian. And if you're a youth leader or a pastor, a primary part of your job to spend time praying, you know, for your people, for the lost, for revival, for transformation. So I just think in the American church, we got so many strategies. We got whiteboards, we got, you know, strategy retreats. We need to get back to good old fashioned prayer, calling down the power of God uh, and good. relentless, like chopping down a tree, Elisa. You know, you don't just hit the tree once and it falls. You got to keep, keep chopping 
You keep chopping. It's frequency and intensity. And the same thing with our prayers, frequency and intensity until God yields timber. And we experience that revival in our youth ministry. All right, number three is double down on the gospel message. Can you go into some detail on that? When you're talking about fixing what's wrong with youth ministry, what do you mean double down on the gospel message? How can we do that? I think we think we can get beyond the gospel. Like, okay, well, we got the gospel, check. Now let's move on to deeper things or move on to more fun things or whatever it is in that youth ministry model. I think we need to bring every sermon, every talk back to the gospel of Christ. We need to give a, the gospel every time there's a group of teenagers that gather. We need to give them opportunities to respond. We need to uh, not just uh, have a come and see mentality, come and see where you can come and hear the gospel, right? But also go and rescue. That means we got to mobilize our students. Uh, for the gospel. And I think we got to put the gospel, what did Paul say to the Corinthians? And the, if there was one church that represents the church in America, it's the church of Corinth, you know, a messed up fleshly church that uh, is easily distracted from the mission. Paul tells them, listen, I determined to know nothing among you except for Christ and him crucified, uh, you know, and I think we need to get back to the gospel. We need to preach the gospel. We need to train our students to give the gospel and we need to have a gospel fest every time we gather together. And whatever else we talk about, we bring it, we bring it back to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, what I, what I tell pastors is, if you're exegeting the text, wherever you, did, wherever you put your hand in the dirt of scripture, you feel around enough, Old Testament, New Testament, you're gonna find a scarlet cord. You pull mm. that up, you follow it to a bloodstained cross and mm. you take your eyes with you, right? We bring it back to the cross of Christ. And so good. I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. I don't know how God infused divine power into a stick that Moses used to open up the Red Sea. I don't know how God infused divine power into a message that when we proclaim it out loud with words, lives get changed. Mm. But we need to gospelize our sermons, our services, our students. We need to equip them to gospelize their friends. My, my pastor once said, we, all of us as Christians, need to preach the gospel to ourselves every day. Yes. And I, I see it so often, you know, Christians getting swept up by all of these counterfeit gospels. And I, I mean, I'm sure there are lots of reasons, but if you're preaching the real gospel to yourself every day, and you're preaching yeah. it to your family and your children, you're discipling your children in that, and as youth leaders, doubling down on that gospel message repetition, repetition, so that kids know what it is. They will not be as easily fooled by a false version that might co come along that sounds really nice and sounds loving and sounds uh, kind of maybe easier and might sound like it's a better option because it's, you know, it, it sounds better. It's a little easier. We have to preach the gospel to ourselves, to the people around us, to each other every day. And I love that you have that as one of the points. So you look at Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, what I received, I pass on to you as first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, he rose again, you know, three days later, according to the scriptures. As you know, this was a pre-Pauline creed that somebody had trained Paul in, he had memorized it, and they're trained the Corinthians in. So I think we need to get back to a creedal form of Christianity that we really drill the gospel in to our students' lives. So we at Dare to Share, we use a gospel acrostic, that explains the gospel story in a way that any student can understand, G-O-S-P-E-L. God created us to be with him, Genesis 1 and 2. He loves us. He cares about us. He made us to be in fellowship. Oh, is our sins separate us from God? Genesis 3, you know, Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden. They're evicted from God's holy presence and can't get back in, right? And so our sins separate us from God. Ultimately, that leads to eternal separation in hell and eternal death. S is sins cannot be removed by good deeds. Genesis 4 through Malachi 4, you know, the blood, the sweat and the tears, the blood of the Old Testament sacrifices, the sweat of trying to obey the 613 commands, the tears of, fail, you know, contrition when they failed could never get rid of that sin. So P, paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again. This is when you talk about substitutionary atonement. Jesus paid the price in our place for our sin. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. E is everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. It's not trusting Jesus and, it's trusting him alone has eternal life. And that trusting, when you trust in him, that is a repentance. That is mm -hmm. a change of mind, a change of trusting in my own self, 
and it's and it's putting my full faith in Christ alone. And then L, life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever. And that's from Acts to Revelation. So we train students to double down on the gospel by equipping them in the gospel message. And like when we have thousands of kids, we all practice that gospel acrostic until they can say it without looking. Because I want them to have that gospel message just seared into mm-hmm. their soul. It's kind of like a catechism, really. It's it's in a way. It, it, it functions like that. All right, so number four to fixing what's wrong with youth ministry is to commit to gospel advancing. Talk about that one. So years ago, we did a research project uh, and we it surveyed uh, through an outside research agency hundreds of youth groups from different demographics. And we discovered that the youth groups that were seeing 25% new conversion growth per year were growing and thriving, had seven key things that defined them. It was interesting to us. They said it in different ways, but they were the same seven things. So we took those seven things. I did a 10 city tour across the nation. I personally interviewed a thousand pastors and youth pastors, ran these seven things by them, got double thumbs up. Um, Then I cross-checked the book of Acts because I don't want to depend on a research project or or pastors, youth pastors' opinions ultimately. And these values are all over the book of Acts and the gospels. And if you look through my Bible, you'll see value one, value two, value they're all over the, the New Testament. And so I ended up writing a book called Gospelize Your Youth Ministry based on those seven values. And those seven values are also in the Failure of Youth Ministry book. And there, um, I use I use actually a, a, a chili pepper as an example of that because uh, the the example is more like Mexican food, like it's a lot of the same ingredients remade in a thousand different ways. So as long as you have these seven ingredients in, you're going to you're going to experience gospel advancement. Uh, kids are going to grow in the gospel and they're going to go with the gospel. It's great. All right. If you're just joining us, we're going to be taking questions in a moment about fixing what's wrong with youth ministry. We're talking through five keys that come from my guest, uh, Greg Steer's booklet called The Failure of Youth Ministry and How to Fix It, which, by the way, is available for free download. Uh, And you can go to daretoshare.org slash resources to find that. But also there at that tab, Dare to Share, it's a letter to, I mean, I'm sorry, Word dare number two share word dot org slash resources. And Greg, you have curriculum that is available for free to download. Tell us a little bit about that and then we'll get into this final point here. Then we'll go to questions. We've got lots of great questions already. Yeah, you know, we've been doing Dare to Share for 30 years, so we've developed a ton of youth youth curriculum for how to share your faith and you know, how to advance the gospel and how to live a gospel advancing life. And last year we decided, let's just make it free as a download so that youth leaders, parents, grandparents have tools and resources. Students can use it with other students and it's all available free. We do an annual free seven hour training called Dare to Share Live, where we'll train, you know, hundreds and hundreds of youth groups across the nation how to share the gospel. And it's free. And it's high quality. I put it up against any simulcast out there. It's really high quality. But thank the Lord for donors that help support and make that possible for us to make uh, make it available for free. So, yeah, just go to daretoshare.org and um, take a look at all the stuff. Yes, and that's daretoshare.org slash resources. And there you can also find the book that you can download for free and all that curriculum. All right, the final key that you list in your booklet to help fix what's wrong with youth ministry is refuse to race alone. Talk about that one. Well, what we're discovering is youth leaders that try to reach the city or community by themselves get burnt out because the number Mm. is too big. And so we we really encourage what we call gospel advancing networks of youth leaders who together will tear off a piece of the map and say, we're going to pray for uh, and reach every student in this community with the gospel through another student that we've trained and equipped. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was in the Coachella Valley and trained 62 pastors, uh, you know, in the seven values of a gospel advancing ministry. And they said, where do we start? I go, you start by this youth leader network that's here. Let them lead the way. And they, I mean, they're identifying the number of students in the Coachella Valley and they're mobilizing to reach. I mean, it's 
awesome to see. We're seeing networks pop up, pop up like that, not just across the nation, but around the world. And I think, Elisa, one of the challenges is we, we're so used to playing defense, mm. right? Because there's so much false theology out there, right? And we have, we have to play defense, right? Um, we, we have to deal with those things. But I think we got to play offense too. And I think offense is evangelism and making disciples. And I think they work together. You know, yeah. when, you, when you really begin to equip your students for the gospel, they're going to ask you questions about apologetics and theology and worldview and all that stuff is going to be a natural part of the conversation. But what gospel advancing is all about is about playing offense together. And so you can't do that alone. Uh, and there's challenges because if a youth leader gets excited about this and goes back, maybe their pastor is not as excited about that. So how do you deal with that? Mm. Right? So we have we have a Facebook community of gospel advancing leaders that kind of brainstorm with each other and pray with each other. How do we do this together? And That's how do great. we encourage? Them? Yeah. Where can youth leaders find that Facebook group? Just go to dare to share.org and there'll be links there. Or can you tell us well, how they can find that? If you just go to Facebook and look up gospel advancing ministry, uh, there is about, I think, 13 or 1400 youth leaders, a part of that Facebook page that, that, and it was about 85% usage. So there's a lot of activity great. happening. There. So great. gospel advancing ministry on your Facebook page and just join the group. Okay, sounds good. All right, let's go to some questions. We've already got some really great questions. Uh, this first one from Chantel Peters. Uh, what are some practical tools to teach sound theology, philosophy, and apologetics, like you're saying we should, effectively to ages 13 through 18? We lead a very diverse youth group, youth group in ages. Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, here's here's what I would say is speak sound truth and sound bites mm. and ask a question uh, when you do. So when you ask a question and you make that super um, open-ended, uh, then you can teach that sound truth and sound bites and that'll lead to more questions that you can ask. Um, and you know that alternative teaching, ask, listen, teach, ALT, is just a simple, simple way to begin to do that. And I would also say, and you you mentioned this before, Lisa, is really make sure whatever you're teaching in that theology, that felt need of the student is there. So for instance, um, I was preaching on the Trinity one time uh, and I talked about to these teenagers, you're never alone because Jesus said in John 14, the father and I will make our home in you and I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit. So you're never alone. Well, I get this letter from this girl, dear Mr. Steer, uh, I've always felt alone. I've attempted suicide several times. I sit at the cafeteria table by myself because nobody wants to be my friend. But for the first time, I know I'm not alone. Uh, the, the father's sitting next to me. This Jesus is on the other side and the Holy Spirit's across from me. I'll never att attempt suicide again. Signed, Lily, age 12. Oh. She's a 12 year old girl that was delivered from suicidal thoughts by the theology of the Trinity. And the twist we made on it was, you are not alone. So when, when you're teaching theology, don't just teach the substitutionary atonement of yeah. Christ by itself. Make a bridge to what does that mean for a teenager? Here's what it means. You may not feel loved, but the God of this universe sent his own son to die in your place. And that son was innocent. Mm. He was without Sin. He died in your place for your sin. He rose from the dead so that he could be in a relationship with you forever. You're so loved. The God of the universe sacrificed his own son mm. and that son willingly died so that he could meet you. You've heard that person is dying to meet you. Well, Jesus died to meet you mm. and you are loved. And so just making that bridge to the felt need is so, so important. Well, it's, and I just want to support what you're saying there, it's so important, especially when it comes to things like substitutionary atonement or something like that, because if you just teach that in a vacuum, I mean, here we are with, you know, we're modern people, that just sounds so kind of weird and, and old and what a strange thing, but when you really connect it all together, that's why I love a, just a more holistic approach to theology where you show how everything fits together, um, where you can't really take 
this piece out and then still have the whole, but how it directly applies to your life. But honestly, Greg, I'm sure you find this challenge as well with young people. One of the most difficult things to convince people of these days is that they're sinners because they've been told from all of their media outlets that they're perfect just as they are. Just, you know, dig down inside yourself and unleash your inner God or goddess and live untamed and all of these things that are being told to them. And so then when you come along saying, well, and Jesus died on the cross for your sins, you're like, oh. I mean, it just sounds so disconnected. So I think, I mean, what you're saying is so important because especially for Gen Z who are getting so much information online, we have to connect those dots for them and explain to them why this is such a beautiful teaching and such a biblical teaching. Amen. All right. So this question is from Kyra. Uh, As a student myself, I've seen kids my age that would rather write an essay to defend Darwin instead of Jesus. Is there any way as a student I can show them how to stand up for their faith? Great question, Kyra. Thank you for asking that. Yeah. And I I would say, yeah, the the best way to do that, Kyra, is to actually stand up for your faith, but in a non-obnoxious way. (laughs) So, So many times, like, we, every every city's got a crazy street, right? Where the, the there's there's mimes there, there's street preachers there, there's all this stuff. And every time in Denver, it's 16th Street Mall. And Denver's a very post-Christian city. And every time we go down there, uh, just about, there's some Christians there that are screaming at people as they walk by. They have a huge repent sign. They're screaming at people. And I'm going to, I go, I always go up to them and say, hey, how's it going? How many people have you led to Christ like this? Well, we're just being being persecuted for sharing our faith. I go, no, you're being persecuted for the way you're sharing your faith. You know, you're kind of being persecuted for being a jerk, (laughs) not Mm -hmm. not a gospel. So, Kyra, I think the best way is to stand for your faith, but do it in a compelling, loving, kind way. Speak the truth in love. And that's why, Elisa, you were saying kind of your theme for this this your podcast what can you rephrase that what yeah what uh, equipping christians to identify the core beliefs of historic christianity discern its counterfeits and proclaim the gospel with clarity kindness and truth that's our that's our motto we came up with to kind of to keep us always in the zone of what we're trying to do here so kyra do that that, yeah. that exactly exactly that you want to do that in love it's like when you listen to preachers you know, you listen to preachers on the radio. There's some that are just like, I love Chuck Swindoll. Like he, he's like listening to your grandpa and invite mm-hmm. you to have his tea and he, he explains the word. And then there's others that are like, get off my lawn, you know, mm-hmm. and you don't want to be the get off my lawn Christian. You want to be the, the one that speaks the truth, uh, but with a smile, with kindness in your heart. Yeah. And Kyra, I would just add, I, of course, I didn't come up with this. I heard it somewhere, but courage is contagious. You know, when you model that, like Greg is saying, other people are going to kind of get a, you know, get a taste of that and they're going to want to be like that. And um, it's I think it's it's you hit the nail on the head earlier too, Greg, it's it's that this generation is wanting a cause. And so, Kyra, show them the better cause, show them, uh, you know, the 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 courageous stand of a person standing up for Jesus and unflinchingly preaching the gospel, truly not being ashamed of the gospel. And uh, that's going to be contagious, I think. So leading by example, I think, is a great a great way to go about that. All right, this question's from Casey. How can we teach our students to be bold and outspoken about their faith in Jesus while also walking the line in their public schools? Yeah, Casey, what I would say is, I don't, I don't know what you mean by walking the line. Um, Students have freedom, actually, uh, to share the gospel. My wife's a public school teacher, right? She cannot jump up on her desk and preach the gospel. Well, she could do it once, her very last day before she got fired, right? Um, But students can share Christ. They can share the gospel. So what I would encourage them to do is my friend, uh, uh, Chris Selby, calls Christian kids that go to a public school federally funded missionaries. And I love that thought. Uh, we can we can mobilize our students to look at every day as an outreach project. Um, that's one of the challenges on the other side with, with your homeschool students or your Christian school students. Sometimes they don't feel like they have the opportunity to do that. So I think with homeschool and Christian school, we need to actually be more intentional about building those bridges to the unreached community, getting them out 
of the house, getting them out of the Christian school and, and sharing the gospel. So I would just encourage your students uh, to every day pray for another gospel uh, conversation that day. That's good. To look at to go into the school cafeteria and look for the kid that's sitting by themselves. And yeah, sit for real. And, what a great opportunity to just show some love and, and build a bridge that way. So good. All well, right, Lisa, this, real, yeah, we, please. We, we have kids that do this. They'll look for these kids that are hurting and say, you know what? Is there any way I can be praying for you? And, and those kids have had so many gospel conversations because they're showing care, they're praying, and oftentimes those students that are hurting will open up because those kids become the priests at that public school. You know, first Peter two nine says we're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light, his marvelous light. That those kids become the priests at their public school that other kids will begin to go to and say, Hey, could you pray for this? Could you pray for this? And those gospel conversations can happen naturally. All right. Uh, this question's from Dr. Squatch. <laughs> I'm sure not the Dr. Squatch from the, uh, the, the soap company, I, I guess that's what that is. Um, question, I'm going to be becoming a small group leader for college students. I'm 24 years old. What should be my top priority? I have no experience as a Bible teacher, but love theology. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, just learning how to like take an, I think, if I was to start all over and, and didn't have training to be able to do that, I would take one small truth and unpack that and ask a question that would relate to the needs of the audience. And I would also, um, you know, start challenging them to share their faith and come back to every meeting with questions that they have as a result of real life, real life encounters. That's good. All right. Dustin wants to know, I'm going into my sophomore year of college for pastoral ministry. I'll be serving in youth group at the church I go to while at college. What should I do as a college student? Well, I mean, I think if you're going uh, as a youth, I'm, I'm guessing the question is as a youth, as a college student, what can you do to really impact these students? I'd really encourage you um, to read that book. Read my book, Gospelize Your Youth Ministry. Those seven values will really help you, not just as a youth leader with those teenagers, but also as a college student. Uh, what I find is Christian colleges need revival too. Uh, I went to Liberty for a year, and then I finished out at Colorado Christian University. And I was the student that gathered other students together and said, let's go off campus, let's share Christ, let's be, you know, I wanted to bring that, because it's so easy. Uh, and we were, we were talking about this offline, Lisa, you can take a sponge and pour milk into it, mm. right? And you can have the highest quality milk, but if you don't squeeze that sponge out, it rots. Uh, in college, in Christian schools, uh, in theology class, it's easy just to get the milk of God's word poured into our, in our minds, but we need to squeeze that out. And we need to do the same thing with our students and the same thing with the other college students. Good. All right, this one's from Esmar. Uh, I have a question about icebreakers. Our community uses them sometimes, which are basically games. And my question is, is this a wise thing to do? Is this a good thing? I guess those kind of like, you know, icebreaker games yeah. that people do. I think so. I mean, you know, it kids, teenagers are still teenagers at the end of the day, and it's okay to have fun. It's okay to, you know, do some stuff for them to get to know each other. What I found is kids feel a little bit comfortable with each other because they played a game. Uh, they did an icebreaker they're more likely to open up when the youth leader asks a question about the Bible or theology, right? And if you don't do that, they just sometimes feel, um, you know, like they can't say anything. So I think, you know, we're, we're humans too, you know, we, we kids, teenagers still like to have fun. Again, this is, yeah. when I talk about the failure of youth ministry, I don't mean stop having fun, stop laughing. What I find is gospel advancing, disciple multiplying youth ministries have more fun. Yeah. So the youth ministry that reached my whole family, Lisa, we had 800 kids in that youth ministry. There was only 300 adults in the church and we had fun, wow. but man, the pastor broke the word open, uh, answered tough questions, would deal with, you know, kind of felt needs, but then he'd always give the gospel. And then we were expected, if we brought somebody, we were expected to follow up with them right after mm. and make sure where it stood. And so it was fun because it wasn't just going to youth group to play a game. We did that, but we were on mission at the same time. So I don't think those things are mutually exclusive. 
Yeah, I, I think too, I think those icebreakers can be a very effective way to making kids feel more comfortable. Because a lot of times, I mean, that's such an awkward age. It's a tough time. It's a oh. tough time to be a person. And when you go into, and maybe you're new and you go into a new situation, it can be um, inviting and it can actually make you feel less awkward and less uncomfortable if there's an organized something that everybody's sort of focused on. So it's not just like mingling around trying to start conversations with people in the beginning. So I, I think that it's um, it's 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 probably a good thing. I would want that to happen at, sure. at a youth group meeting that my kids go to because I want to know that they walk in and they're going to feel comfortable, that there's something that people are focused on and it's not just going to be like, oh gosh, I hope they find somebody to talk to, you know? So well, I, you know, that's, that's the great, on the, on the positive side, youth ministry, you know, Overall, as, a, as an institution, it has failed to capture the hearts of our generation and, and to keep the students within our groups. But we do have a ton of resources that are very practical and, you know, uh, easy, easily accessible. I got friends that download Youth Ministry, DYM. They got tons of stuff that's available for youth leaders. Youth Specialty has been out there for, you know, 30, 40, 50 years or something like that. So there's tons of tools and resources to help on the practical parts of icebreakers and having fun and skits and different things like that. All righty. Uh, this question is from ES. How do I tell my church slash youth leaders that things need to change in the organization of sermons and the preaching? Yeah. Okay. Be, I was a pastor for 10 years. Let me just say this. You don't want to be that person that they cringe at seeing come to them. <laughs> you know that, Hey, I have a list of changes that need to take place. <laughs> don't, Start by praying for your pastor and youth leaders. What I, what I really find is I don't think the average pastor or youth leader gets up and says, you know what, how can I become more institutionalized today? I think down deep inside, there's a gospel beating heart in the, in, in the, in the hearts of most you know, evangelical youth leaders uh, and pastors. There's a desire to see this happen. They just probably don't know how. So start praying. I'd encourage you to download the failure of youth ministry, read it yourself, Maybe pass it on to them and say, you know what? Um, why don't you read this when you get a chance? I'd love to get your thoughts about it. I just read it. Uh, and it's making me think, I'd love to get your thoughts. And come as an encourager with thoughts and ideas. And then as you build that relationship, you can you can lean into that more and more. But just don't lead, don't lead with a headbutt, mm -hmm. right? Uh, lead, lead with a smile and a prayer. I agree, especially when it comes to something like the organization of sermons and preaching and things like that. If there's something that's been taught that is uh, a, a false gospel or there's some sort of false teaching, that's probably a different category, different question. At that point, my advice would be, you know, you need to have a sit down with the pastor, but respectfully, lovingly sharing your concerns, but also being equipped with information. So you're not just sort of shooting arrows, but try to sort of build that bridge and say, look, these are some things that the kids are saying they've been taught. Hey, can we have a, a discussion about this? That, that would be maybe different. But as far as organization and things like that, um, I think, you know, Greg's right on the money there. First, start by praying, praying for them and trying to come alongside and being a help in that way. Uh, next question is from Dr. Leslie Jacoby. Can you speak to elementary kids? Our church uses the Gospel Project. Do you find this curriculum to lay good groundwork for teen youth ministry? I don't know. I'm, I'm sure you you prefer your curriculum, but are you familiar with Gospel Project? I'm not really. Somewhat, I'm somewhat familiar because um, we have a lot of youth leaders that use it. I've heard good things about uh, about that curriculum. I cannot speak personally, definitively, but people I trust uh, speak, speak well about the Gospel Project. So um, the fact that they have gospel in their title is a good is a good sign. And again, the challenge I think with all these curriculums is going to be it's the challenge of becoming gospel centered. And I, I want to be careful when I say we can become gospel centered, which just sounds like a bunch of people sitting in the half circle watching Matt Chandler videos, right? And I'm pro Matt Chandler, but I'm like, put them on your podcast and let's be gospel advancing. Um, and let's advance the gospel, not just, we don't want to just exegete it. We want to execute it as well. And so whatever curriculum you're using, make sure uh, you know, I wouldn't give the keys. So if I have a, I have a 17 year old daughter, right. And if some strange guy came up to me and said, I'd like to ask your daughter, I'd like to know, we need to get to know each other a little bit first, maybe for several years. And then we'll <laughs> see, um, 
I'm not going to give the keys of my kid's mind to some curriculum writer that I've not vetted. And so what I really encourage youth leaders is go over the curriculum, make sure you agree, make adjustments as you need to. You probably need to add in a gospel advancing factor somewhere in there, because a lot of times there's not an evangelist, evangelistic outreach emphasis in a lot of curriculums that I've discovered and modify that to make it make it fit because you're responsible as that leader of what your students take in. Don't just give the keys of, of their minds to a curriculum writer you don't necessarily know or haven't vetted. Yeah, that's very wise advice. And uh, we're about, gosh, we're about out of our time here, but I wanna close with a question that I personally have, one that I've been thinking through and I'd love to get your thoughts, Greg, mm -hmm. as you've maybe pondered a similar question. I remember once hearing Jay Warner Wallace talk about the youth exodus, what we refer to as the youth exodus, which is this uh, sort of epidemic of kids leaving the church after high school. And he said something that I thought was very thought provoking. He said, they're leaving us because they were never with us. That's a paraphrase. I can't remember exactly how he worded it. And his point was that so often the way that youth ministry and even children's ministry is structured, you send the kids off to this other place and then all of a sudden they graduate high school and then they're supposed to go into, you know, maybe what they call big church for the first time. And they've never even really been to big church before. And it's almost like asking them to take a leap into an entirely different culture that they've never been a part of. And so I think swirling around this question as well is the topic of interge an intergenerational approach. I mean, you're you're not a t you're not a teenager, Greg. You know you're you're no. you're beyond those years. You're somebody who's coming from more of a fatherly perspective. What are your thoughts on that? Just the maybe the intergenerational approach. What what does that have to do with it? And maybe what what advice would you give to youth leaders about integrating their students into the main uh, the main service of the church? Or you know how would you approach that question? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I have a friend, uh, Derwin Gray, um, at Transformation Church in uh, Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. He, uh, I preached at his church about a month and a half ago, two months ago. And one of the things he told me backstage, he goes, and I knew this is true because I listened to his podcast, is he speaks directly to teenagers in the group. Hey, teenager, I want to talk to you right now in the church service. Uh, by even just doing that, he's including them as as part of it so i really do think it's important if you look in titus 2 older older men invest in younger men older women invest in younger women uh that doesn't mean we can't have youth group or a youth meeting but that means that i think our students need to be used to going to church and they need to be used to being a part of it and i think it's more than a youth sunday you know i got to preach in big church when i was 12 years old and it wasn't because i was a good preacher I was a terrified little kid that had a, you know, seven minute sermon that, that, you know, but the pastor believed that teenagers needed to exercise their spiritual gift. I wasn't the only one. I mean, he, he didn't fuse us as part of the service. He equip us and train us and mobilize us. So I really do think we need an intergenerational approach. That's, that's really what we see in scripture. Yeah. Very good. All right. Well, Greg, let everybody know where they can find you online. Of course, we've already mentioned uh, daretoshare.org slash resources. You can download the book. You can download a lot of free curriculum. What else you, do you have going on, Greg? Uh, well, I have a blog, uh, gregsteer.org, and it's S-T-I-E-R, so gregsteer.org. And you can follow me on Instagram or Twitter, uh, just at Greg Steer, S-T-I-E-R. And, Great. Uh, Yep. I'd love to. Uh, we, I've written like 20 something books uh, that deal with youth ministry and teenagers. I have books uh, to teenagers. Uh, we have books for youth leaders and we have uh, Unlikely Fighter, which is my, my memoir of my crazy, crazy family and their radical transformation. So, yeah, <laughs> just go here. All right. Well, I want to thank my guest, Greg Steer. And you can go back in the archives and hear my interview with Greg about his book, Unlikely Fighter, where he shares his testimony of coming to faith in Christ. If you're listening on audio platforms like Google, Spotify, uh, be sure you go over there and leave a five-star review. If you're watching on YouTube, click subscribe. Be sure you click on that bell icon to be notified every time we release a new video because we have some really, really great conversations coming up. But for now, thank you so much for watching today. Happy Sunday, and we'll talk to you next time.